Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Usakko. The topic of my presentation today is ICHSX immunotoxicity, S8. The guideline is open to the public. It's um, on the website. Immunotoxicity in IND and NDA. How can we uh, incorporate immunotoxicity data? And non-clinical and clinical immunotoxicity uh, data in IND and NDA, how can they be described and designed? We will um, take an example to help you understand better. S8 guideline, immunotoxicity guideline, is to uh, detect immunotoxic compounds in non-clinical approach. In identifying immunotoxic compounds and understanding the characteristics, there is a list of tests. In IND and NDA preparation and general toxicity testing, some of these uh, test tests uh, for immunotoxicity is not included. Immunotoxicity is the um, area is the section which was established um, the latest. The ever since the research started, how is it um, ha uh, integrated into the preparation phase? There was a discussion until early 1990s. There was a research going on, and what would be the method? thoughts to be applied to guideline and how to do the test setup. Those were the research topics. During the research period, the current immunotoxicity approach in drug development starts from general toxicity. And then what is the next step? Weight of evidence based decision-making approach is recommended. And this guideline does not include protein product. There are five categories in immunotoxicity. In a narrow definition, there are two. Unintended immunosuppression or enhancement are included in this guideline. Drug-induced hypersensitivity and autoimmunity are excluded. Immunogenicity in the old guideline was included, but not in this one. So basically, immunosuppression and immunoenhancement, although, of course, there are only a small number of cases, there are drugs with certain objectives, such as anti-cancer products. Before I begin the presentation, this is a little background. Immune system is coming from hematophomiamic system. So in hematophomiamic system from stem cell, there is myeloid or lymphoid. For lymphoid progenitor, there are three cells, B cell, T cell, and NK cells. From myeloid progenitor, there are the rest of cells. RBC, erythrocyte, platelet, basophil, esonophils. And for granulocyte, uh, monocyte and neutrophils, also coming from myeloid uh, progenitor. In immune testing, there were questions like what is not a lymphocyte? B cell, T cell, they are not lymphocyte. Background of this guideline. This guideline 
is for evaluation of potential adverse effects on the immune system should be incorporated into all standard programs for drug development. Non-clinical uh, people did not really think a lot about immunotoxicity, but this could uh, come back in the later stage. So, uh, photo safety and immunotoxicity must be considered. In general, people do not pay much attention, but in the later stage, uh, there could be issues. So when there are immuno problems in organs, then um, it's a serious issue. So during the initial developmental stage, immunotoxicity must be considered to make sure that there are no unexpected issues in the later stage. Immun immunomodulator For example, immunosuppressants, it has pharmacological effect. So this is based upon pharmacological effect. But the compound that can cause immunotoxicity, anti-proliferative anti-drugs, for example, the mechanism is clear because it's about anti-proliferation, anti there will be immune suppression for proliferation. So extra study is not required. Justification is um, already provided. The strongest strategy for immunotoxicity is to see where and how the toxicity occurs so that clinical um, study and risk management plan uh, can be designed. What would be the optimal use case to avoid um, immunotoxicity? Mode, mechanism of action must be clearly identified. drugs not intended to affect immune function but cause uh, immunotoxicity. Uh, there could be uh, innate immune function or suppressed with anti-inflammatory agent. So anti-inflammatory agent suppressing innate immune function during the development phase, no additional toxicity test required. In immunotoxicity research, these are the, uh, the factors to be considered. This is the conclusion of the guideline. For all drugs, when we think about standard toxicity program, uh, except for proteins, when we uh, develop synthetic medical product, through standard toxicity study, immunotoxicity test and study can begin. Weight of evidence must be looked at and analyzed. And the results, if it requires additional immunotoxicity test, then you uh, take the next step. And the result of standard toxicity study indicates no immunosuppressive actions and no evidence, then we can conclude there is no immunotoxicity. And this, with standard toxicity study, uh, is the end. No additional tests required. In case uh, there could be immunotoxicity, the additional toxicity test is done. If it the result is serious, the mechanism must be identified. With additional immunotoxicity test, uh, when immunotoxicity was not detected, no further study is required. 
However, with the immunotoxicity study, if it's clear indicate that the data indicates immunotoxicity, further additional studies are required to identify the mechanism of the action. ICHS-8 guideline talks about factors to consider. First, findings from standard toxicity program. What are the results? Second, pharmacological properties, uh, mode of action, and other pharmacological properties. Third, who is the intended patient population? Fourth, structural similarities to known immunomodulators. Fifth, drug disposition. How uh, is the drug moving? Uh, where it gets stuck? And sixth, clinical information. Accumulated clinical data uh, can be this clinical information. Standard toxicity studies are utilized and it includes preliminary and GMP toxicity studies. Using these standard toxicity studies, risk, risks are assessed regarding toxicity. From GLP toxicity tests and animal tests and in vitro um, tests, currently pharmaceutical manufacturers have QA and QC operations, and my responsibility is there. Last week, we received EMA inspectation, and prior to that, MFDS inspection. And um, it's fortunate that I could be here today because all of the inspections finished. From the perspective of GMP, all of the decisions must be made based upon risk assessment. Risk assessment is uh, applied not only for GMP, but also for GLP and toxicity. It is one of the most important tools for interpretation of the test results and making a decision. As a tool, how do we evaluate immunotoxicity? After the toxicity test, let's say there is an alteration in immune system organ weight and histology. Uh, the spleen weight reduced, cellularity of lymph node change, and the cellular uh, light of bone marrow changes, or changes in thymus rate. These are important indicators for immune system. Next, changes in serum um, albumin globulin, serum LG ratio. Immunoglobulin belongs to globulin. So the changes in serum globulin matters. Albumin indicates the liver status and nutrient status. And AG ratio and serum globulin um, change is another important sign. These are expect, if the changes can be explained, then it's okay. Let's say in toxicology test for antibody drug product, serum globulin increases and it's natural because the drug itself is immunoglobulin. When it's given in serum, 
um, test ratio in test results ag ratio goes down albumin ratio goes down it's not a disease it's because the drug substance is immunoglobulin increase of infection when immune uh, function goes down infection increases In non-clinical GLP laboratory, the facility is clean and there is low risk of contamination. But there is a urinary um, test for rodents and non-rodents, and there could be urinary protein um, increasing or WBC detection increases. In general setting, Uh, there is no, not a lot of urinary infection, but immune suppressed animals, uh, these can be found. So, urinary tract infection uh, must be closely monitored. Increased occurrence of tumors. Usually, it takes long to form the tumor, but for long-term studies, there could be an increase of tumor. Um, if it has impact on genotoxicity and hormonal effects, uh, the increase of tumor can be the reason, but if tumor occurrence increases when immune uh, function goes down the organic tumor generation increases so with all this information uh, we can determine whether this uh, compound is immunotoxic or not with all these signs present depending on the uh, statistics significance of these signs with animal tests there are various signs and not all of them are necessarily statistically significant so statistic analysis and biologic impacts such as creatine kinase when this activity goes up muscle damage can be suspected and this can be a parameter for heart disease. When it goes down, there is no relationship with toxicity. So is it biologically significant change? Even with the sign, how severe it is? Is it related to dose? All these must be considered. And is this secondary effect? If so, it does not uh, create immune toxicity, but if it has an impact on the overall health on animal and if uh, stress level goes up and it's, uh, if it's a secondary impact, um, it has a secondary impact on the immune system, then it's not immunotoxic. As for secondary target, whether the mechanism can be explained or not. This one's also important. When developing drug products, when the dose is high, uh, the immune organs are damaged. Which organ at a lower dose gets affected the most? So for general toxicity test, we look for the optimal do dose. The first uh, damaged organ must be identified. Well-designed general toxicity study um, makes sure that the dose is not too high because it will lead to damage in too many organs. That is not an ideal toxicity result. Which organ at which um, level of dose um, the toxicity is observed if um, the dose is higher uh, then it's uh, less important 
and reversibility is about the recovery when um, the administration is stopped. So far, I talked about standard toxicity programs. There is pharmacological properties to be considered. If it's anti-inflammatory drug, additional immunotoxicity uh, test might be required. And if it's an intended patient population, for example, if it's AIDS patient, they are, uh, we need to make, we need to do more research on immunocompromised patients because they uh, might be under other um, immune um, treatment. And the structural similarity to known immunomodulators, thymus, spleen, and bone marrow. Uh, whether there is a higher concentration of drug on these uh, organs. Additional immunotoxicity test is done independently before phase three. In this case, uh, there could be phase one and phase two data. So clinical information must be considered. And then we do risk assessment, weight of evidence review. The basic tool for risk assessment is Excel spreadsheet. Um, vertical and horizontal axis. standard toxicity program, what uh, was the findings and what is pharmacological property identified and the signs. And out of one to three scale, one lowest, three the most severe. So if the severity level is three, then we uh, convert it into scoring system. So we calculate the overall score for one item. If there is enough evidence of immunotoxicity, additional test is required. If um, the risk is weak, it may not be required. But in more than two items, if there are slight indicators, then uh, the probability of having additional immunotoxicity test is higher. So based upon the overall score, you make a decision. If a score is um, higher than a certain level, additional immunotoxicity test uh, must be implemented. And this decision must be made by people in charge. So it's not about uh, you make a decision based upon your gut. Um, the regulatory agencies would require the risk assessment based decision making process and documentation supporting that decision making uh, process. So you have to have the documentation explaining the procedure and you have to show them why you decide to have additional immunotoxicity test. That can be a very strong document for you. Putting together a powerful documentation is important uh, for license out before phase three. All these information for license out could add values to your work. So these uh, drug candidates, are they coming from um, um, places with these considerations that uh, makes a big impact and difference? So risk-based approach is always recommended. So uh, we do have the standard toxicity study and the general toxicity study. And then we do have the additional immunotoxicity study to be conducted. 
usually rather than utilizing the general CRO, it's better to uh, work with a specialized CRO on the immunotoxicity study. And it is really important to have a robust setting from the beginning in order to have a good interpretation of the data. So what kind of the things are done by such an CRO? When we start the additional immunotoxicity study, the first approach is the TDAR or the TDAR, T cell dependent antibody response. This type of immune response is triggered only by T cell. And I will talk about it in more detail when I talk about the uh, study design. Facts or the immunophenotype is already becoming an important tool. So this is quite widely adopted. And the testing procedure is relatively simple. Immunophenotyping and it can be used for the immunotoxicity study. T-dependent antibody uh, response study, if you want to do it, then when it comes to the study design, it should be repeat those study can be 28 days or it can be two weeks, 14 days. So it's quite similar to the toxicology or toxicity study because we already observed the symptoms and also set the uh, dose. So 28 or 20, uh, 14 days of the toxicity study design is also taken here. And what is important is that the high dose need to be above NOIL. And of course here, the, if the secondary effect is observed, it is not a good sign. So it should be below the level of secondary stress. And always those response need to be observed with the established dose in the study. So we conduct one additional study, then do we have to go for further studies or not? When we need to decide on that, if there is no risk of immunotoxicity, then there is no need for the further study. And we need to think about when we stop this kind of a study, then it requires risk and benefit decision, meaning that if we are having sufficient information to do the risk benefit uh, decision making, that would be the fine point. Uh, sometimes we need to do additional or the further studies if we want to include this substance in this composition, then we need to spend more money and we need to uh, persuade the, uh, the executives or the management level. So it would be great if we can just screen out those substances from the very beginning because it will reduce or make our lives much easier, but when it comes to the anti-cancer drug or any other drugs, sometimes some drugs, even though they have the immunotoxicity, they do have the value so that they need to be developed into a full product, but still we need to assess the risk and benefit of taking those drugs. So the information need to be obtained sufficiently to make such a decision. If the information is sufficient, then there is no need for further study. And when we submit the NDA, there is a risk management plan attached. So clinical study is done and when we apply for the marketing authorization, we need to submit risk management plan. It includes the cautions for the uh, patients and also cautions for the physicians. So this will be included in the risk management plan. So if we have sufficient information to write a risk management plan, then uh, we can stop there. Then when do we conduct immunotoxicity study? So, 
of course, it would be great uh, that if we can move to the clinical study after finishing all required individual studies, but it would not be the case many times, uh, let's say, for the reproductive toxicity testing when uh, the study need to be done is it before NDA or before phase 3 so the timing is important and if the uh, if you think about the phase 1 involving like 20 persons then if you want to do the immunotoxicity study at the time it will cost a lot and the process will be delayed so considering those factors you Usually, before phase three, the data from various studies are provided before we are having many number of the participants in the clinical trial, we produce data. And here, we need to uh, look at which population we are targeting at. So it's not like a certain set of formula that we need to produce the data of immunotoxicity before phase three. Sometimes it may be required during the phase one or before phase two. It depends on uh, the regulatory agencies, including FDA and others. What the reviewers want to see, decide which data and when such data need to be submitted. Sometimes supplementary data may be required during the, uh, the trials. So from the company's perspective, if the regulatory body requires a lot more, and it's really difficult because it increases the budget, it increases uh, the time, and the management will not like it. So personally, you know, as a member of the company, I am squeezed between the regulatory requirement and lack of understanding of the main uh, management. So what I'm trying to say is that generally, the immunotoxicity study data are required before phase three, but sometimes it is required at any other time point. So you need to talk about it to your uh, management. So, I talked about the immune system, and when we have the, a program or the lecture on the immunogenicity, usually we talk about immune-related topic and then talk about regulation. So, of course, we do have the expert, like the specialized CRO, so that we can have a full support. But still, even in the case, we need to understand the overall mechanism involving uh, in immune immunity. So what is antigen uh, presentation? Macrophage or the phagocyte? As you can see from here, it comes into the endosome. Within the endosome, low pH and other enzymes, peptide, small size, they are processed into a small size and compartmentalized. And MH class 2V, the target antigens will be presented. So antigen, the foreign antigen comes in, and then macrophage or APC or antigen pre uh, presenting cells in that it is digested. And on the MHC class two, it is presented so that the immune cells can recognize that the foreign uh, antigen is in body. So that's uh, what antigen pre presentation is about. So once we have the antigen presentation, there is an interaction with T cell. T cell receptor, MHC class two and peptide, there is an uh, interaction, then T cell is activated. Once the T cell is activated and then 
usually white cells, the number of the white cells is low, but uh, here the number increases. So there is a proliferation. So through this proliferation, uh, B cell and T cell, the number increases. So here the antigen processing and presentations are done and at the end of the day between T cell and B cell there is another interaction occurring. So B cell is differentiated into the memory cell or plasma cell. Then the plasma cell will generate antibodies, secrete antibody. And then they will remove the antigens. So T cell is really important for the uh, immune immunity. That's why we call it T cell dependent antibody response or TDAR. And that is also an assay for the immunogenicity. It's quite widely used and for the antigen C varvisi or the red blood cell was used. That was commercially bought or in the really old years, we draw blood from sheep and extract RBC. It was quite good tool in the past using RBC and it is still being used sometimes, but still in recent days, KLC is being used, KLH which is a protein is used as an anti antigen. So uh, with the ELISA, we can measure that. So immunized KLH and anti-KHL uh, can be measured. So PDAR is uh, evolving into a more easier way to use. So blocking is used in the past, was used in the past with the RBC, but it was not, it's not easy anymore. And it's kind of an outdated one. When I was young, I did it. But still for the quantification, ELISA works better. So this is for the two week repeat dose uh, study. I took it from a published literature. On day 15, you can see it says day one, uh, it's two weeks here. If the immunosuppression is not well dis uh, detected, and then we can go for 28 days design. If it's a 14 days design here, antigen comes in, then generate antibody here. It takes some time. So 300 micro uh, per body, microgram per body. So KLH um, is injected and then the second boosting and then antibody uh, titer is measured. So the design itself can be done by expert on the immunotoxicity study because immunotoxicity study method is one of the most latest one. And there is a reason for that. Compared to other toxicity, there is so much individual variability in the immunotoxicity. Even if we do have 10 animals, some animal return a value of one and others two. So it's really difficult to have those response. And therefore, in the case, we need to increase the number of the samples. So the individual variation outweigh the dose-related variation. So, of course, there is a saturation, but still, uh, there are some issues to be considered. And those relationship is really important. Those responses re is important in order to decide whether there is a toxicity or not for the uh, immunotoxicity. So it's quite complicated. And 
if it's uh, it, because there are uh, high variation, it's important to decide how many number of the animals need to be involved. And is it really uh, toxicity present? when we do not have statistical significance. So these, there are many different and difficult questions to be answered. And at the same time, immunotoxicity is not present in many cases, but still it's an important component in the study, so we need to know it. As I said, facts is quite widely used, and it is quite uh, affordable now. So which cell population uh, is targeted? That can be uh, discovered and the lymphocyte population would be the good one here. So the lymphocyte population, whether there is an increasement or decreasement, that can be uh, measured with the hematologic uh, devices. But there is a T cell, B cell, and K cell, and CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. So there are so many different types of the lymph lymphocytes. So the cells are very uh, classified now. So when we inject or administer a certain drug, then the B cell uh, will decrease. So that kind of details can be uh, confirmed, and then we can build more strong or stronger narrative. Let's say uh, CD4 population is specifically suppressed or it is increased. So this kind of a, a observation can be made with the lymphocyte population. That's quite simple to do. And of course, we can make it as an independent separate study, or we can do it in a parallel with the uh, 14 days immunotox uh, 14 days study. So if there is uh, a huge potential for immunogenicity, then we can do it together like spleen. If we use blood, then it will not be working that much because the blood is required quite, far quite much. But we can uh, use a, a, a piece of spleen here in order to see the changes in the lymphocyte population. For NK cell activity, it's important. In while when we develop anti-cancer drug, NK cell activity is more important than others. The NK cell is often mentioned in the function of food to improve the immune system. And there is even a self kit, diagnostic kit on the uh, NK cell. So NK cell activity is closely related to the immune system. So when it comes to the NK cell, there are many developers focusing on it in drug development. If there is no normal NK cell activities, and if there is a tolerance, for example, in normal situation, MHC class 1 here, uh, antigen here is a self-antigen. So NK cell and this antigen and if it's a normal antigen, this is a self antigen, then this is not killed. So even though the NK cell uh, is close to it, it didn't, uh, it doesn't kill it. So there should be immune tolerance. The tumor cell, the level here for the NK cell can be a low. So it may recognize that this is not a self antigen, so it, I should kill it. So NK cell kills the tumor cell. However, for the drug developers, what we do is that Herceptin, HER2 antigen uh, is bound with this antigen, or you can think about uh, rituximab. It targets CD20 antigen on B cell. And this is for leukemia. So this kind of a 
Antibody drugs, as you can see here on the surface, the antigens are specifically recognized by this antigen. They are bound uh, to that. So at the region on antigen, there is a, a site which is recognized by, by this NK cell. So NK cell recognizes it and then uh, kills it. And as you can see here, PD-1 and PDL one if there is an infection, immune tolerance will uh, be generated. And in normal situation, the immune system is suppressed, and therefore it, this will not be killed. But anti-PDL1 or anti-PD1 uh, antigen is utilized, and there is a blocked. So there is an immune tolerance. However, it is blocked. So immune is inducted, and therefore the tumor cell can be killed. So this is how we can uh, modulate NK cell activity. And immunogenicity, which cell, on which cell is is activated, whether it is an NK cell or lymphocyte cell. So those things can be studied by uh, when we look at the NK cell activity. And there is a host resistance study. In the past, it was a really strong tool to understand immune uh, immu immunity. For example, wisteria bacteria. A, when a drug is treated, a certain bacteria, those bacteria, some of them would not die. So the animal which took a lot of drugs that can improve the immunity when the animal is administered with the listeria, or when we, uh, when the animal have the listeria, it is not killed. However, animal with the immune system depressed or suppressed, those animals are all dead. So it's quite a strong tool to see how strong the immune system is. But there are two issues. First of all. It's really difficult to handle listeria in the animal lab. BL2 or BL3, depending on the bacteria, the requirement would be very difficult to follow. So it's not easy to do it actually in the animal lab. And if you think about the animal welfare, the end point cannot be set at the mortality, even if it's an animal. So because of these issues, whether it is listeria or a viral model, parasite models, these are good tools to see if it is good for the immune system or not, but these are not used quite a lot recent days. And the thing is that the analyst can move around. So we need to think about the potential contamination issue too. But still, the tumor model is used quite well. The anti-onco drug developers utilize tumor model quite a lot in order to see how fast the tumor grows or how quick the tumor is killed. So when the immune system is suppressed, the tumor grows fast and vice versa. So it can be one of the general tools to be applied. And another important cell in our immune system is the macrophage. Macrophage here recognize and uh, remove the foreign materials or the foreign substance which enter the body. An antigen presentation uh, can be done by macrophage. And there are tools to see this. In the past, it was quite complicated to use. Charcoal powder was used in the past, but now the fluorescent bead 
are well developed. So it's quite not difficult to do the test here. As you can see, the fluorescent uh, V bead is used. And outside of the cell, in the normal pH, there is no fluorescent. But when it is entered into the macrophage, phage and phagocysts occur, and in the endosome, PHD drops, and then we can see the fluorescence coming out. So phagocytosis uh, uh, is done well, so we can see that. Or the fluorescent bead can be just mixed and do the facts and wash it. Then we can see how much cells are in the in here. So there can be many different approaches that can be taken to understand uh, macrophage activity. And cell-mediated immunity can be measured with the delayed type hypersensitivity. And there are not many organizations that can actually do this testing, actually. Although it is stated in the kind of a textbook, textbook but it's not easy to uh, check and confirm the delay type hypersensitivity in testing. So as a conclusion, I would say that whether we have immunotoxicity or not, actually we can predict it before we move into the clinical trials. We usually make a go or no decision and in-house assessment is done. So for we repeat those study, even before that, we can understand whether there would be immunotoxicity or not. We can consider that. And as one of the techniques, in the standard toxicity report, we can include immunotoxicity as a small chapter or small section, if possible. So if it's the case, then it will help us a lot when we write uh, the application for IND and others. So we do not do the separate toxicity study local toxicity, immunotoxicity, they can be assessed in the uh, overall toxicity result. So if we have a small section on it in the general toxicity report, then that would be great. So the sponsor need to talk about it. And of course, if it's possible, if there is no immunotoxicity, it would be great for people who are involved in the non-clinical stage. But if you have to do the immunotoxicity study, then we need to select the specialized CRO for immunotoxicity study. And also, at the end of the day, all these study need to be well described in the risk management study or the well, uh, management plan. Immunotoxicity can be present, but still we can develop a drug. So what we have to do is to uh, describe well the overall scheme and how we can manage the risk in the risk management plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Go. Now we will take questions. Any question from the floor? Please raise your hand if you have any questions. So no one um, is making an eye contact with me. It seems like no questions from the floor. Now we will take pre-submitted questions from Hyun Jung Kim. If the uh, immune system is in human but not in a mouse, even in that case, is it uh, necessary to have the uh, immunotoxicity test for mouse? Well, I guess it's case by case. 
if the target organ is not present in rodent, uh, it's not necessary to have a rodent test. I mean, you cannot do that, right? But for clinical tests and in human, if there are other symptoms um, anticipated, you may need to be a little more creative in preparing for the data. When you have a discussion with a regulatory agency, it can be helpful. Thank you for the answer, Director Ko. Thanks for the answer. I hope that answered to your question. So once again, um, I'd like to thank Director Ko for his passionate